Analysis of Philippine politics from an institutionalist perspective would emphasize three major points. First, history matters. The legacy of the past bequeaths upon the present is considerable, and the timing and sequence of events matter since history is path-dependent. Second, Political actors behave the way they do because they hold certain views about the social and political environment they inhabit. The ideas they hold about their environment are then crucial to the way they act and hence to political outcomes. Third, ideas matter. Political conduct is shaped profoundly by the institutional context in which it occurs and acquires significance. Despite its long experience in democracy, the Philippines has failed to consolidate democracy and deliver on its promise of development. Hence, Philippine democracy has been described as an elite democracy characterized by the following. Elite perpetuation. Holding political power for longer increases the probability that one's heirs attain political power in the future, regardless of family characteristics. Political monopoly. Akin to monopoly in the market where a single player or cartel of players control the market. This is equivalent to a market failure. Elite capture. Capture of institutions by the elites to pursue their particularistic interests, for example, rent seeking. Extractive institutions. According to Asemoglu and Robinson, Extractive institutions are designed to extract incomes and wealth from one subset of society, for example, the masses, to benefit a different subset, the governing elite. Public institutions were implanted in the Philippines during the period of colonial rule. The process of colonial state building was undertaken in the following manner. First, local autonomy preceded the development of central authority. Second, Party formation preceded national elections. Third, elections preceded bureaucratic institutionalization. Fourth, there was a suppression of peasants and working class parties, thereby preventing the emergence of ideological party contestation. Adapting the indirect rule strategy of the previous Spanish colonizers, the American colonial administration relied heavily on local clans or principalia to consolidate colonial power throughout the archipelago. The combination of a powerful presidency and the electoral system for the House and the Senate also served to amplify the historical and sociological deficiencies of the Filipino party system. In fact, these two institutional features have remained relatively constant across the pre- and post-authoritarian periods. Aside from these two, Patronage has also been a constant feature of Filipino politics in the two historic junctures. Interestingly, post-1986 party politics resembled the pre-Marcos era in substance but not in form. The return to democracy brought with it a whole host of new parties rather than the return to prominence of the nationalista and liberal parties. Yuko Kasuya has attributed the increased number of parties competing in elections to the increase in the number of viable presidential candidates in the post-Marcos period. In her presidential bandwagon framework, the introduction of a single term limit for the office of the presidency destabilized the legislative party system since legislative candidates now tended to affiliate themselves with the most viable candidates by switching parties. Aspiring presidential candidates think they have a higher chance of winning without an incumbent running for re-election. The absence of an incumbent vying for re-election coupled with the weak party loyalties serve as incentives for potential presidential aspirants to launch new parties and entice legislative candidates to switch parties with the promise of access to patronage. The unitary state has existed in the Philippines for almost 500 years. The Philippine archipelago has long been burdened by an over-concentration of political and administrative powers in Manila, which prevents full support and services from benefiting the farthest reaches of the country. Moreover, the unitary state has stunted growth and development in the different regions. There have been several incremental and piecemeal attempts to decentralize the unitary state. Despite the long experimentation with decentralization, 
Metro Manila, Calabarzon, and Central Luzon account for 62% of GDP, while 14 out of 17 regions account for only 38%. For 2016, the budget for Metro Manila and Luzon accounted for 56% of the entire General Appropriations Act, compared to 16% for LGUs. The traditionally poor regions of Western Mindanao slip farther behind because of prolonged state of conflict. Thus, government expenditures and revenues have remained highly centralized even after the passage of the Local Government Code and the devolution of local government units. It has become apparent that rather than enhancing decentralization in the Philippines, the unitary state has impeded it. Thus, we have reached the limits of expanding autonomy under this centralized form of governance.